Uh, we can now speak to Talk TV correspondent Holly Hudson, who heard Dame Angiolini deliver her statement uh, earlier this morning. Uh, are we there? Uh, oh, hi, Holly. Uh, what's the situation? Uh, what was the mood like in the court? I mean, it's an extraordinary report that uh, must have had jaws dropping uh, inside uh, the uh, arena there. Yeah, very much so. It's an extremely damning report, as you mentioned there. And you heard the Home Secretary, James Cleverly, say that the report is deeply distressing, promising a prompt response. He said Sarah Everard had been failed in more ways than one by the people meant to keep her safe. It's nearly three years to the day now, Kevin, since the 33-year-old was kidnapped, raped and murdered by Wayne Cousins, who is, of course, serving a rare whole life order in prison. And this landmark nearly 350 50-page report uh, into exactly what happened has been two years in the making, commissioned by Cleverly's predecessor, uh, the then Home Secretary, Priti Patel, a public inquiry uh, to look at Wayne Cousins' conduct, his behaviour, and find out were there any missed opportunities by the police. And this report really highlights and hammers home the fact that there were a series of failings, a series of red flags, as Lady Ailish Angiolini put it missed by police. Uh, she led the inquiry and said that Cousins could and should have been stopped and not only that he shouldn't have been a police officer at all in the first place and unless there is a significant radical overhaul as she said uh, immediately more officers like Cousins could be allowed to operate in plain sight. Now those failings and those flaws relate to police vetting processes, police recruitment processes and what Lady Ailish Angelini described as lethargic and inadequate investigations. For example, the report finds that despite failing police vetting clearance, Cousins was still admitted to three police forces. In some instances, officers missed or even ignored reports about his indecent exposure. In fact, the report highlights that Cousins continued serving as a police officer despite eight separate reports of indecent exposure. And I think one of the most shocking revelations uh, in this report relates to his behaviour, his previous predatory behaviour and horrifying new allegations of sex crimes before he murdered Sarah Everard. The report details how following uh, Cousins' arrest, the police received reports from complainants who said Cousins had sexually assaulted them He's included an attempted kidnapping at knife point, as well as two allegations of rape against two separate women. But most significantly and seriously, Cousins allegedly committed a very serious sexual assault against a child who Lady Ailish Angelini described as barely in her teens. She said uh, this was before his policing career even started and evidence of that historical allegation of the very serious sexual assault suggests his offending was not an isolated incident and may have been a pattern of offending dating back years. She also specifies that she believes that there could well be more victims of Wayne Cousins, also because of the, the fact that police uh, do not respond to reports of indecent exposure, exposure sorry, as they should. And many of her 16 key recommendations that she made relate to the approach to indecent exposure by the police and by the government. And she makes a series uh, of recommendations in relation to that that, as well as a radical overhaul of vetting and recruitment and steps to root out what she said was so-called banter and remove discrimination, saying that while Wayne Cousins was not wholly a product of a work of working environment, uh, that didn't discourage his misogynistic view of women and meant that his deviant behaviour could flourish. And I think we can hear from Lady Isla, um, Ailish Angiolini and now, who, within her statement earlier here, uh, paid tribute to the family and urged police to read her report now. Without a significant overhaul, there is nothing to stop another wing cousins operating in plain sight. I would urge all those in authority in every police force in the country to read this report and take immediate action. Sarah's parents and loved ones live in the perpetual grief and pain of having lost Sarah in this way. Her death and the public discourse it caused should galvanise those responsible for policing to ensure that those who have the privilege and power of protecting us can be trusted. 
Well, the Metropolitan Police have issued a statement to Mark Rowley saying the report published today is an urgent call to action for all of us in policing. We must go further and faster to earn back the trust of all those whose confidence in policing has been shaken by events of recent years. And Kent Police said additional learning contained in the report will be implemented in full. They can reassure us of that. But this is only phase one, Kevin. There is phase two still to come and phase three, which will look at the wider behaviours, the wider police culture. So there will no doubt be more shocking revelations and more for policing in the UK to confront as a result of this inquiry. Thanks, Holly. Thanks, Holly. Well, let's speak now to Shabnam Chowdhury, who's a former detective superintendent at Scotland Yard. And we're, of course, still joined by journalist and author Ella Whelan. Shabnam, thank you so much for coming in. This report is really disturbing. He failed his vetting, first of all, at Kent Police, but then went on to become a community police officer. But this actually gave him the same kit, the same ability to arrest, the same sort of protections, one could say, the same level of public trust as a normal police officer. How? How could this have happened? Well, how could it have happened? I mean, let's not forget that he was in debt and that was on his first application and that should have been a huge red flag. And you talk about red flags. Red flag seems to be prevalent across policing and it seems to be a theme and a pattern of behaviour that's missed across policing, which just indicates what a uh, culture there is embedded within policing that these type of behaviours that others will see as banter um, and as a laugh and a joke amongst lads then uh, transpire to this uh, horrific, horrific incident and crime. I tell you, I read the... Um, I can't... Uh, I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. Well, Shadon, you know, what are we talking about here? I mean, I know for a fact that as of about a year ago, I don't know whether they've uh, raised their game so far, but uh, most police recruits to the Met were not even personally interviewed. They just fill in a form, and if it ticks all the right boxes, they're in. That's ridiculous. I hope they've ended that system. I hope that every recruit gets personally interviewed. Otherwise, who knows who's going to get into the police force? You'll get more and more wing cousins, won't you? Uh, but as a former detective, a detective superintendent, but you work for Scotland Yard at 30, uh, uh, for 30 years. Uh, you, what are we talking about? Are we talking about, uh, obviously, coppers, I think, looking after themselves, but more than that, maybe a lad's culture? Uh, as a woman who worked there, did you experience that? Well, look, misogyny, racism was um, the norm back in my early days of policing, and I think the McPherson uh, review and the inquiry there highlighted that many years later. Fast forward that to the Casey review, which was initiated after the murder of Sarah Everard. Um, same, same and similar behaviours have been identified, so very little has changed. I will give Mark credit some, uh, Sir Mark some credit in that there's certainly been an uplift in a significant amount of police officers who I've been suspended, who have been restricted or who are being investigated and convicted of serious crimes. But what that tells you is that the vetting process is so broken and so flawed, which is why they're being allowed in. So you've actually got this problem twofold. You've got the vetting processes where thousands of officers have come into the organisation without even a face-to-face -face to, -face to a yeah. certain mm -hmm. degree. Um, and then tick boxes where if you're asked, are you a neo-Nazi or are you affiliated to them? Do you um, watch pornography or anything like yeah, that? Yeah, like they're going to go, yes. Well, they tick yeah, a I'm a neo-Nazi no. and I love extreme porn. Exactly. Yeah, they're going to say that, they'll, aren't they? They'll tick the box that says no and that's the end of it. Yeah, There's know. no fact-finding. You know, back in the day when I joined, they'd come to your home address. They'd come and they'd do a face-to-face -face interview. They'd look at the neighbourhood that you're looking, living in. They'll do checks on all your family to see who's living in your home. I recall police officers had to move move out if there were, you know, members of their family that mm. were criminals. Now, they shouldn't be punished for that, but they were told, you can't live with that member of your family. So mm. those kind of policing processes around vetting, the real deep dives into those that are coming in mm. need to be dealt with. The sec second... Are you saying, Shadow, sorry to interrupt, but are you saying uh, what I just said, that they're still letting coppers into the police force who have not been personally interviewed? Without a doubt. Jeez. They're being interviewed, but they're not being vetted to the, the, the degree that they need to be vetted in. And I think that, you know, cutbacks have made a huge amount of difference. But when you had COVID, uh, this changed the dynamics of policing and the dynamics of how they do the vetting. What they did after that, I think, was use it as an excuse. Actually, we don't need to use our resources. We can deploy the resources elsewhere. and We can do this tick box system. And then you've got the likes of 
uh, Wayne Cousins and you've got David Carrick. Remember, these two worked mm. within and under the same Don't forget command. what uh, Wayne Cousins' nickname among his police mates was The Rapist. That was his nickname. And David Carrick had um, a, a name that I won't repeat on Similar, here either. Yeah. Last week only, a serving officer, former officer, was sacked and convicted of several rapes. He came into the it. police mm. not that long after the whole situation with Sarah Everard occurred and he'd been there'd been allegations against him. It was thirteen rape, rape, thirteen yeah. rapes. Thirteen rapes. Yeah. He was officer. then convicted of a rape that was no further action. So there were some real serious questions for Sir Mark to answer. He cannot just arrest his way out of the mm. situation. The biggest problem he has is not just the dirty rotten apples, but changing the culture yeah. and the behaviours of officers. I'm not going to deny there are thousands of really good, hard-working cool. officers, mm. but you only need a few that actually make it really, really difficult for the rest of them. And that is where the trust and confidence is absolutely rock bottom and broken. My heart breaks for the family of Sarah Everard today. Yeah, Shabna, I can see you getting emotional about that. I think we should reflect on what the family has said. This is their statement. It is obvious Wayne Cousins should never have been a police officer. While holding a position of trust, in reality, he was a serial sex offender. We believe Sarah died because he was a police officer, she would never have gotten into a stranger's car. We strongly support recommendations and trust they will be implemented. We no longer wait for her call. We no longer expect to see her. We know she won't be there at family gatherings, but the desperate longing to have her with us remains and the loss of Sarah pervades every part of our lives. That is very powerful, it's, very powerful. It's when you put people into the context of this, when you take away the facts and statistics and the debates and remember what happened, that it does. I mean, as a woman, it, it makes me very upset to think about that poor girl. But you wonder, actually, if um, all police officers had to hand in their devices for scrutiny, as you would do if you were joining the intelligence services, quite how many would pass the threshold? I think that's another problem within policing. I think what happens is people get into these little WhatsApp groups, yeah. they get a relationship amongst the co colleagues that they've got, and they think they're in a safe environment. They're not. They're not. I've got nephews in the police service. I constantly tell them, do not engage in that kind of behaviour. And if you hear it, you see it, you call it out. And I think that's another big challenge, is where people have to have the courage to actually speak out. He did that to Sarah Everard's family. He did that to thousands and thousands of women across the UK who don't have the trust in the police. And he did that alone. But he did that because he was allowed to get away with those red flag behaviours. He was allowed to behave in a certain way that was ignored, not challenged, and uh, a failure of the leadership to actually address those issues. And as I understand it, right now, there are a significant number of Met Police officers, probably couples all over the country, who are serving officers who are charged with or being investigated for domestic violence mm. uh, and a number of other offences. So you said that Sir Mark Rayleigh can't arrest his way out of that situation. Now, I totally agree with you. But I would also suggest he can't apologise his way out of this situation. Uh, you know, I'm sure he's doing his best, but he seems to be taking a long, long time. And this is about... Uh, police trust, trust in the police. Ella. So, Ella, as a woman, uh, uh, do you trust the police? How do you feel walking around the streets of London these days? Um, no, I've never had much trust in the police. Um, I think that probably most women have at least a healthy scepticism of um, police officers. They have <clears throat> a huge amount of power, and that's part of the problem of what happened with Wayne Cousins, yeah. is that if you, you wield a, you know, a lot of power and persuasion, um, as someone wearing a uniform, and tragically, that's why Sarah Everard, a very intelligent and cautious young woman like many of us, mm -hmm. um, decided to um, take his direction and get into the car. I think that the interesting thing about, in terms of women's freedom in all of this, because after Sarah's murder, there was this national discussion about women walking alone at night and women's safety and things like that. Um, and. And I think it got a little bit sort of um, misdirected and blurred. And there was sort of a, a, a total panic about women being out late at night in general. Mm. When in actual fact, I think we need to remember that this was a really specific thing that happened, mm. that most of the violence um, committed against women is in a domestic setting. Mm -hmm. And so you're, you know, women, I wouldn't want anyone to see what happened to Sarah and be too afraid to leave the house, for example. It's extremely rare. And it was very unique in terms of this was a police officer who used his power. It wasn't just any old guy. Um, I think in terms of what it means for the police, you know, 
anyone who's there's a huge amount of calls now for extra police intervention into women's lives whether there's that um you know uh, policing cat calling criminalizing behavior and things like that uh, for me i don't want officers involved in my life if, yeah. if, if it's all possible not least because i don't trust them but i think they're really you know for most people watching us at home it's kind of a no-brainer it seems to me a no-brainer that if for such an important and um, powerful role as the police, mm. that if you have even the, the whiff mm. of, a, of bad behaviour around you, doors shut, but it's just a no-go. Do we not have a problem, though, that in some respects there's been a broad coarsening of society and women's freedom is being mortgaged on the back of men's freedom? So, for instance, someone talking about hardcore pornography now, whether it was a group of estate agents in a WhatsApp group or a five-a-side football team, wouldn't raise any eyebrows. That's kind of completely been normalised. So then how do you know the one who's talking about that is someone who wants to go and perpetrate something similar? Well, it, it's hard, isn't it? Because, obviously, there is, you know, there are places in private spaces where we make jokes and go too far. And I think for most people, that's just part of what's called banter and it doesn't go any further. But then there are people like Wayne Cousins and the men who surrounded him in these WhatsApp groups for whom it was much more serious. It wasn't just banter. It was a sort of playing out of fantasy, which then revealed itself in real life. And, um, you know, I, I don't know where to tread with that. I think that private spaces where people can speak freely are an important part of a civilized society. On the other hand, as you were saying, you know, these these WhatsApp groups can be sort of fertile ground for um, real abusers well, I, I, to I play think, out their fantasies. I think there's a key message out there. And one of the key messages is stop putting the onus on women. Stop making yeah. women feel that they have to take responsibility for when they go out. Remember, when this happened, it wasn't long after when the Met Police put out a statement to say that if women don't feel safe, flag a bus down. You know, or, you know, you take the onus on yourself. This has got to stop. And I think this has got to start in the very early stages of educating young kids at home. You know, mm. when, a, when a young man goes home and his parents say to him, how did you get on? Did you pull? You know, blah, blah, blah. And they have this conversation about his behaviours toward this young girl. And yet when they speak to the girl, you can't behave like that. Don't don't go out to, yeah. you know, it's, it's yeah. all, you know, the guy is always the hero and the girl is always, or the female mm -hmm. is always the one that is either responsible or the onus is on her to take responsibility for her own dress code, for her own behaviours, yeah. the way she uh, portrays her, herself. Yeah. Well, well, well said. Uh, and know, it's impossible you. to overestimate, uh, overstate what damage Wayne Cousins did because of course until then if a policeman approached you late at night you go oh well it's okay it's a copper because of Wayne Cousins, Cousins even that line of trust is shattered. Uh, Shadman thanks very much for coming in that was a very uh, interesting to that's one way of putting it very powerful stuff thank you. Uh, now your texts and tweets have been coming in this lunchtime on this topic Murphy says it's too late once trust has gone it's gone forever and Frank agrees he says it's too late you're not going to get it back is there any institution in the UK that still has the public's trust? And meanwhile Mark says get more police onto the streets dealing with actual crime rather than saying it's not worth the paperwork and Tim says police without fear or favour and keep politics out of police.